views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello everyone and welcome to the Social Justice Forums. I am Darren Jaime and of course, we thank you for joining us. If anybody asks what the Social Justice Forums are about, well, it's an opportunity for an hour to discuss Many of the issues will take you to a deeper understanding of many of the iniquities, that, inequities, I should say, that uh, a lot of people are facing, particularly in this challenging time. And then we go into deeper dialogue. We present multiple viewpoints. And then, of course, we also promote civic engagement. And coming up on this show, we'll talk about judges, we'll talk about justice, and then some. So stay tuned, because the Social Justice Forums starts now. And welcome back, and we're glad to have you here on the Social Justice Forums. We start in the borough of the Bronx. The careers of at least eight Bronx Supreme Court justices will come to an end. This after the Court of Administration decided to terminate nearly every judge over the age of 70 in New York State. Chief Judge Janet DeFiore said the OCA's administrative board also denied the recertification for 46 of 49 judges who applied across New York State. Now, under state law, Supreme Court justices are required to apply for recertification, as well as go undergoing cognitive exams every two years after turning 70 until they reach the age of 76, which is the mandatory retirement age. Now, the determinate, I should say not determinations, but the terminations are actually a cost-cutting measure for a court system that's actually seeking to cut about 10% of its budget, roughly $300 million. What exactly does this mean for Bronxites? What exactly does it mean for the judges and those persons that actually are going to come to the bench? Well, joining us now to share a little bit more of details is the founding partner of the Haken Law PLLC, uh, Matthew Haken. And Matthew, good to have you here with us. Thank you, thanks for having me. Yeah, it took the long way around, but the bottom line is some judges are gonna be out of work. And um, you know, for 46 of these judges, uh, a lot of questions as to, first of all, how this all came about and what this actually means for them. But um, let's talk about this. Uh, any surprise that 46 of these uh, judges were not reinstated? Yes, I, I was surprised. I, I didn't see that coming. I'm not sure if, uh, if other people did. But usually, you know, once so there's this old law we have that once judges hit 70, uh, they have to be they have, they have to be recertified and they have to go through these cognitive exams, which seems really it's uh, it was really insulting to the judges. Um, and uh, it's really just a pro forma thing. Um, I think in general, they're just recertified regularly. Um, but, you know, there's this cost cutting measure. Um, and it's, uh, it seems just to be, I mean, to me, it's a really bad idea. And there are many other ways they could, uh, the, the Office of Court Administration could save money. I know everybody's hurting in the pandemic. Um, but this is a time when we need more judges, not less right. judges. And, and getting rid of judges is just going to make things go even slower. Um, and because of the pandemic, now I can, I'm happy to get into that. Things have been pretty much just. I'm. I know only the civil side. I'm. I don't. I'm a. You know, I do personal injury, so I don't know the criminal side. But um, everything is pretty much just at a standstill. Yeah, and when we talk about this, I mean, we on, on all of our shows on on Bronx that we talk a little bit about the criminal justice system. We talk about the court system overall and how it's been deeply impacted by the pandemic. Uh, we know already prior to the pandemic, there was a backlog of cases, right? Uh, now you've got this pandemic. You've got 46 of the 49 judges who will not be returning to the bench. And the obvious question on the hearts of New Yorkers is, how is this going to affect me if I've got a court case how's it going to affect me if i've got something you know in advance if you will yeah it's it's going to make everything go even slower um you know for instance in in personal injury cases which is really all that i know uh the insurance company usually if you if you get injured you sue there's usually an insurance company that's defending the case or if it's a self-insured entity like the city of new york or the transit authority um their their whole the whole goal of the defendants is to delay 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 right they have the money in the bank in the stock market wherever it is they want to just hang on to that money as long as possible earn that interest and just try to delay as long as possible it's just kind of the general the general defense 
Um, and they only really pay top dollar when they see that there's a trial date coming up or even, you know, a lot of times, a lot of cases settle mid trial, they settle after you pick a jury or as you're about to go to a jury trial. Um, and with the court system, you know, shut down for, for there was eight months approximately where there were no trials. Um, I mean, cases did settle, but all the insurance companies in the city, they, they made everybody take a discount pretty much. They said, if you want to settle now, you know, who knows, who knows when there's going to be a trial, you know, our, our old, our old um, weapon of, we'll see you in court, you know, it was like, we'll see you in court someday. You know? Right. Um, who knows when. Um, so we, you know, the cases did settle, it definitely had to take a discount. Um, and then the courts did open up. Uh, it was it was good. I mean, I think Judge DeFiore did a great job. Uh, she got the courts across the state open. Uh, they had some trials. They had all these COVID protocols in place, um, but it only lasted a few weeks. Um, and now there's this second wave, which really shouldn't have come as a surprise to anyone. Um, and now they close all the courts, and there's there's um, Judge DeFiore, which she's the chief judge of the Court of Appeals. Uh, and she's the chief, she's in charge of the, uh, the court system statewide. She said, she issued a statement, I, I think it was two weeks ago, saying that jury, uh, Zoom jury trial, you know, virtual jury trials are going to start ramping up, I believe was her word, but there was no set date, you know, she didn't say anything concrete about when it's going to happen. Um, and now the insurance companies are just, they're just laughing. I mean, they're, they're laughing all the way to the bank. They're, you know, who knows when the trials are going to start. And it, it, it's, it's really a, a disaster for people who are, who uh, have a court date coming, you know, theoretical court date coming up, um, right. especially if someone's injured and they're out of work. Um, you know, they're waiting for that court date and it's, it's, it's really, uh, it's in the best interests of everyone but the insurance companies to have to move these cases towards trial, especially if somebody, let's say someone was injured, you know, at a, you know, hit by a car or whatever. And then now that person is getting, they had a bunch of treatment uh, that was paid for by Medicaid uh, or they're on, uh, you know, they're getting SNAP benefits or Section 8 housing. Um, once they get, once they go to court and they get a nice settlement, they'll be able to pay all that money back to the government. Um, right. So it's really in a lot of instances in the government's best interest to get these cases moving. But uh, for whatever reason, there just seems to be... Um, you know, I, I don't know what it is, but there's just, there seems to be no motivation to get virtual trials going. And they've, they've happened in, in other states. Right. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to be rambling on here. No, 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 I was gonna jump in and ask the question. So when you talk about that, right, you talk about virtual trials, you need judges in order for these trials to occur. So if we take in 46 out of the 49, uh, right here, that we're talking about, you know, in the Bronx, talk to me about how do you replace these judges? How quickly can we get new judges to the bench? I, mean, I, I think my understanding is that that they're not going to be replaced. I mean, you know, they, they could have, I mean, these are, you know, by, I mean, by default, I mean, these are judges over 70. So they've, you know, they've been around. These are some of our most experienced, uh, you know, learned judges. Um, I mean, these are the people we should be asking to stay longer, I think. Um, and my understanding is they're, they're not going to be replaced. Um, wow. They're just going to be, this is just going to be empty seats. And it's just the, the, the cases are going to be, uh, handed off to other judges. Um, and I have, I have two cases in front of judges in Manhattan, not, not in the Bronx, but in Manhattan. Uh, and they were two of the 46. Um, and one of them, uh, everything's done, except we're just, we're just waiting on the judge to decide some motions. Um, and as soon as the insurance companies found out um, that uh, the judge isn't gonna, you know, is not gonna be here anymore, uh, they, they reduced their offer. Um, you know, and they just, they just, cause they know it's going to be, who knows how long the motions are going to go to another judge. And um, that judge already has a full caseload so that, the, you know, the, those motions are going to go to the bottom of the pile. So we might have, uh, you know, a six month delay, uh, until the next judge decides these motions, the pretrial motions, and then who knows when we'll actually get to trial. So it's, it's, it's really, I've, I've, I've in my, uh, let's see, 13 years doing this, I've never had an insurance company make an offer and then reduce it. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're finding right now. Yeah, they, they, you know, they, they're, they're just, I mean, they're reading the tea leaves and they said, well, you know, they, it's like, 
they just they know that the the plaintiffs are going to get desperate no judges no trials um and uh they can they kind of just they're dangling you know they're bottom feeding they're just they're just giving these very small offers and and um they know people are going to get desperate and they're going to start taking them yeah for future clients that you know you may be dealing with um talk to us about what kind of conversations do you have to have i mean that's a very hard conversation to have to say possibly potentially listen you have a legitimate case right possibly could win but do you have enough strength patience to wait it out yeah it's really hard especially um i mean i have a client uh an, an older gentleman um he's 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 pushing 80 and uh he said well this you know this isn't fair if you know i said this this could be years before we get to trial and he was saying well can't we just settle quickly i said you know i I would love to settle quickly i mean and often you can get a quick settlement um you know you have to take somewhat of a discount but you can settle cases you know within a year of the accident um and he was saying well i don't understand this is this isn't fair if we if we wait if we wait too long you know i might die and i and i had to say well, that's that's what they're hoping, right? That's I mean, it's it sounds awful, but that's what I mean. That's like the insurance company's dream with an older client, um, especially now with COVID. Um, if the client dies, you know, you really don't have much. I mean, the case pretty much vanishes. So um, they they would love that, um, and uh, that's that's just you know that's that's their game. They 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 hold all the cards now because our leverage is gone uh, with mm -hmm. with these all these judges gone um and no trials on the horizon yeah so the so the honesty is that the insurance companies are you know pretty much happy about the situation with the backlog and all that's going on for an average person who doesn't know right you talked about a settlement reaching a settlement and then moving uh you know closing that settlement out give us an idea from the amount of time that a uh, judgment is rendered for you know your client uh to the time that the insurance company has to actually pay that settlement out is there a long wait period in in engulfed in, in, in that too uh no no that's that's pretty quick that's i mean um when once you settle a case in new york they're supposed to pay within 21 days um unless it's the city they have 90 days um and if you get a verdict, um, I, I believe it's the same thing, unless they appeal it. But once once you once you actually you know once the papers are signed or the the jury renders a verdict, payments pretty quick. Unless unless the other side of you know unless they appeal, which which can happen, that could be another couple of years. Um, How but, often do we see appeals? I mean, I would say I would say more than ninety percent of cases settle before trial, and then of the cases that actually go to trial and go to a verdict um appeals you know i, I i'm i'm not sure i would say it's a i would say a uh, lower percentage a yeah um yeah. Pro probably less than 50 percent um mm -hmm. but i you know i'm i'm really not sure on that um right. but it's it's uh it's the rare case that that gets that far it's the the cases that you know that the, the average person who's been in an accident has a case you know once they get close to trial everybody starts everybody starts getting a little nervous you know the insurance company wow well, they think wow well, you know this jury could give a lot of money and that might be upheld on appeal and the and the plaintiff side you know my side we think yeah we could uh we could roll the dice and and get this big verdict or the jury for whatever reason might give us nothing mm -hmm might give us less than they're offering so everybody starts kind of becoming a little more realistic you look through your file a little more carefully you see some maybe some flaws you didn't notice before the insurance company does the same thing maybe a witness you thought was going to be able to show up can't uh everybody starts you know in that that month before you get that trial date everybody really starts to comb through their file and and you, you each side has to sit down with their client and say okay we might want to settle this one yeah, um, yeah. And then somebody well, go to trial. What are the conversations that you're having with other attorneys? I mean, obviously, uh, 2021 is right around the corner right now. We are in the month of December. Uh, give us a little bit about what your conversation is looking towards the new year. Obviously, we're trying to uh, overcome this second surge. Uh, in addition to the second surge, you've got all the collateral damage that actually falls out and literally uh, falls into your lap. So talk to us about what are you expecting uh, going into 2021? 
Yeah, well, I mean, it's 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 going to be tough. Um, I mean, other lawyers are saying the same thing. I mean, we, um, you know, everybody's, of course, hoping for a vaccine, hoping we can get back to normal. We, we, we would love to have trials in person. Um, I mean, there's the whole issue of even if you have a trial on Zoom, are you going to get, you know, what kind of trial are you going to get? Is it going to be, is it going to be fair? Is it going to, people going to be paying attention? Um, but everybody is, um, I mean, everybody's having, everybody I know, they're having difficult conversations with their clients. And they're saying, you know, look, this is uh, this is the offer. I'm sorry. I know. I know you thought you were going to get more. Uh, you could take it now, or you could you could wait. Maybe we'll start having trials in a few months. Uh, might be two or three years. You know, um, and th- there there have been Zoom trials. This is the the frustrating part for me. Um, there, Florida. I believe Florida was the first state they had. A tr- it sounds like a joke, but it's it's really true. Florida had a trial in August about an injured stripper. Um, I, you know, I guess in, in in Florida they're considered essential workers. No, that that was no <laughs> joke. But uh, they, joke they, I'm there. from Florida, so I can, um, But uh, they had there was an injured stripper who was she was injured. She got beat up by the bouncer. She sued. They had a full Zoom jury trial. Um, everybody was in a different location. It worked. Um, and then uh, there was an article. Uh, I believe two weeks ago on this website, Law 360, about a federal judge in Seattle, Washington, who is like the pioneer. She started having Zoom jury trials. Now other judges are doing them. Um, you know, this can be done. It's not that complicated. I mean, I'm sure you know you you've been on calls with Zoom calls with a lot of people. Um, and she talked about how she thought maybe there was going to be, um, you know, a generational divide. You know, but. People could figure it out. I mean, I've been on Zoom wedding calls with people in their 90s and they're using Zoom. Um, right. And, and the other issue was what if people don't have a computer or they don't have internet access? And I mean, that's not a hard fix, an easy fix. The court system can give people computers. And you know, in New York, if the court system is saying they, they don't have computers, they don't have the money, every personal injury lawyer in New York would donate money to the court system for them to have laptops to give to jurors. I, I, I guarantee it. Um, so it, it just doesn't seem that logistically difficult. Um, and in the, in the article, she, this, this judge um, Peckman, she addressed all these issues. She thought people wouldn't be paying attention. But in, in her impression, I mean, she's a federal judge with 30 years experience. She said she felt people pay just as much attention on Zoom as they did in person. And they didn't have to deal with, um, you know, somebody missing the bus, somebody caught in traffic or whatever, uh, yeah. somebody stuck in line at the metal detector at the courthouse. So of course, there were some technical glitches, but it wasn't any more than in a normal setting. Yeah. So I think it, it could work. Yeah. It could work. We'll see how it goes. Uh, 2021, right around the corner, of course. We'll see. And we got to have you back, Matthew Hagen. Thank you so much for joining us here on Thank the you. Social Justice Forums. Thanks a lot. Okay. All righty. Well, we want to give you this note about Bronx judges that were affected in that. As we say, the numbers were actually uh, 46 of the 49 were actually, well, let me see, 46 of 49 were not recertified. Of those 46 that were not recertified, eight came out of the borough of the Bronx, the Bronx leading all counties in soon to be terminated judges, uh, judges in the Bronx uh, who lost out on the recertification, Judge Justice Ben Barbato, uh, Justice Robert Johnson, Justice Donald Miles, Justice Howard Sherman, and Fernando Tapia. A three criminal term justice, Lester Adler, Stephen Barrett, and Nicholas Icavetta will also be let go. And so we'll continue to follow the story here on the social justice forums and how it actually plays out, particularly in the borough of the Bronx. Stay with us. We do have more show coming up. We'll be right back in a few. Taking public transportation, don't touch your phone. Carry hand sanitizer and use it immediately upon leaving the bus or train. Avoid touching your face. If someone is coughing or sneezing, move away. Wash your hands with soap and water as soon as possible. Limit contact with poles. If possible, avoid rush hour. Don't eat or drink on public transportation. Keep your bag off the floor or other surfaces. Avoid directly touching turnstiles. Stay up to date with the latest from your local health department and CDC.
And welcome back to our show. The Bronx Developmental Disabilities Council is an association of parents, advocates, consumers, and professionals concerned with the needs of people with developmental disabilities who reside right in the borough of the Bronx. Now, through their executive board and their standing committees, as well as special events, they provide a forum for the discussion of issues. They also provide information and support the families and advocate for social and economic issues that affect the quality of life of the people that they serve. They're connected about the quality of life to people with several developmental disabilities, as well as neurological impairments and learning disabilities. And through the pandemic, disabled individuals are suffering due to a lack of federal support and funding for services. And here to provide more information about, this is the Bronx Developmental Disabilities Council's Vice President, Omira Andino. And then also we've got the Family Vice President, Edie Weber, and uh, good to have you both here with us on the Social Justice Forums. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Well, when we talk about, uh, and we'll go right at it, you know, developmental disabilities, um, we know New York State is suffering with a huge financial crisis, also New York City, but talk to us about what you're finding, uh, particularly with the developmental disabilities community in regards to being able to provide services, particularly at a time like this. So from, from the provider perspective, I'm also the CEO for IAHD, and we mm -hmm. provide services to upwards of uh, 750 people who have developmental disabilities. And we've, we've really um, experienced the challenge of COVID similar to the rest of the population, um, but in a different way. We have people who live in residences and we have people who attended our day programs. Uh, we had pre-COVID, we had upwards of 440 people who attended in-person day programming. You know, we had March 18th marked the day where things just drastically changed. And from one day to the next, people had to be provided services at home in the residences that we support. And then we also had people in the community who did not live in any of our residences that needed to be provided with support. And that, that they faced a lot of challenges there as well because when we tried to change over to virtual programming, we, we saw that there were a lot of inequities, a lot of families who were not able to access um, you know, Wi-Fi and couldn't get services via the internet. And then we had, we had to change things drastically in the residences and provide day programming services that we're equipped to do in the program in the residence now. So it's been a big challenge. We've had um, in our industry, People with dis developmental disabilities are five times more likely to contract COVID. And so that presented its own challenges because we're dealing with people who have a hard time in many instances, you know, following those rules that we talk about, wearing a mask, social distancing, washing your hands, uh, because they don't necessarily understand the impact of those things. So it's, it's been a big challenge. Yeah. Edie, can you give us a little bit about the Developmental Disabilities Council for people who may not be so familiar? Talk about the great work that you guys do. So, uh, you know, I just want to touch on from the, the parent perspective um, before we get into the, the council itself. And, you know, I have a 22-year-old son with autism that receives uh, in-home services. He's also in a supported employment program. And, and I personally see my son regressing. I, the advances in behavior and his psychological well-being are, are being lost. Um, I, Omira touched on, on virtual um, programming. Virtual programming doesn't really work for everyone. You know, many people need assistance to participate in, in virtual programming. The, their routines and their lives uh, have drastically changed, as has um, for, for all of us. But I, I think that we need... Um, we need shorter, uh, more targeted virtual sessions for these people. And, um, you know, there's also additional costs for families. I mean, not everyone has access to technology. I mean, the, 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 the digital divide is real. And I, and I don't think many of us really uh, understand that until we're faced with this type of situation. And, and not only does it impact just my son, it impacts everyone in the house. So when we talk about... Um, services, I mean, from March 13th, uh, really until September, he was without services. And it, it totally disrupted his life. Um, what we do, um, you know, from uh, 
the with the work on the Developmental Disabilities Council. It, it's really a lot of advocacy work, and we can't have um, we can't have our children lose the services that so many parents fought for. I mean, there was a time when there were no services, and the only option available to families was to put their child in an institution. And we cannot go back to those days of Willowbrook. So the work that we do on the council with Elmira, the provider network, and more importantly, the families to speak up and advocate for our children uh, are vital. Yeah. Omar, I want to go back and stay on topic for a minute and talk about this because, um, you know, Edie breaks up, uh, brings up and raises a very valid point. Since March, she's had to really deal with this transition. Uh, automatically, somebody will say, listen, this is normally something that affects uh, the, the child, but in the but uh, she creates a uh, a great point. It's not just child, it's family. So families are actually being impacted by this when a child does not get the necessary services. Let me talk to you from a couple of perspectives. Number one, um, on that virtual perspective, which she talked about, everybody does not do well virtually. And number two, um, what can we be doing to kind of assist in a time like this, given the fact that we're in the second surge and it doesn't look like for the foreseeable future um, that things are going to be shifting? So one of the things that we did at IHD in March, when we realized that a lot of families would be disenfranchised, basically, is we came, we developed a team that had to call the families every single week. All of the families, we had 125 families that could not access services anymore in person. So we had to have pull resources to call those families. We did a survey to find out how many of them needed support, you know, with technology. Some of them just needed us to bring them a laptop or a device where they could have virtual services. But then there was the learning curve. You know, to your point, Darren, people, not everyone, we, we take it for granted sometimes because we have it so readily at, at our fingertips. But many families, not only do they not have access to it, but when they do, then they have to learn how to use it. And um, that's not so simple. Then we're, they're also dealing with in, individuals who lived at home with their families that were so used to going to a day program that now when they're home the, all of the time, it creates mental health issues and behavioral issues that the families have to deal with. So there are just layers and layers of, of issues that are compounded by, by COVID. Yeah, so I know that you guys are really outspoken as we talk about the advocacy work that goes on, raising your voice in support and against these cuts. Uh, and of course, New York City, New York State, uh, facing huge cuts, particularly due uh, to the COVID-19 crisis. We already had some challenges already. COVID-19 really magnifying that uh, to a higher degree. But I know that you also have a rally that's coming up, talking about Save Our Services. So uh, talk to us about the Save Our Services rally and how the public could actually become more aware of what you guys are facing and contending with. So the rally is, um, again, it's, it's, it's the advocacy work of not only the Bronx Developmental Disabilities um, Council, but it's really a statewide initiative. And it's, it's a parents group that got together. And um, we also had a, a mobile uh, car rally um, uh, in September uh, to talk about Save Our Services and, and, and how the, the, the cuts are impacting uh, services to, to families. And, and I think that, um, you know, while the state's not responsible for the pandemic, um, but we're all responsible to confront the challenges um, uh, that we're faced with the moment and to con continue to support the most vulnerable um, of our population. And um, this will require more funding, not less funding. And um, right now, um, Prior to the pandemic, there were cuts faced by uh, service providers, and, uh, and Elmira could touch more on that. And um, you talk about uh, with the cuts, how it impacts staff retention. Um, again, my son receives in-home services. So he's gone for months without services because there was no staff to provide the service. And it's not, uh, you know, it's not that easy, right? You have to find a match. This person is coming into your home and again, it impacts the entire family, not, not just my son. So when you have a revolving door of staff coming in and out because, you know, they can they have to have two and three jobs just to, to help support their own families. Um, what does it do to the person who's receiving the services? You know, I, I often hear my friend, um, my son say, how come my friend's not coming to see me anymore? Trying to explain why. You know, my son's no longer having his friend come over and provide those supports is, is a, a difficult conversation that I continue to have. Yeah. 
And so it seems to be getting worse rather than better. Omari, you jump in. So, you know, we haven't had an increase of, you know, a basic cost of living increase in our industry for more than a decade. And mm. so that was already, we were already facing challenges with funding. And uh, when the pandemic hit, one of the things that happened is they allowed us to, to continue to receive our revenue um, and bill for those people who were not attending programs. So they allowed us to, to bill and, and be made whole. At a certain point, they said, okay, you, once people can return to program, you will not continue to get that retainer day. When people now are in the, pro so for instance, we had people who attended day program and if someone tested positive and they all had to remain home, we, can't, we couldn't continue to bill for those people who had to stay home. And that led us to now have to furlough people because we didn't have the funding to be able to pay those staff who were gonna be you know, still in the, in the program. So there are, you know, the, the effects are cumulative and they don't, they don't, it's like I'm trying to figure out the best way to put it. They don't understand sometimes that it's not just, there's these 20% withholds that we had it's not just that, it's the cuts that have been happening over time and the lack of funding over time that now is really compounded by, by COVID. Right. It's a domino effect, which is, that's the saying. It takes, yeah. you know, what's happening right now is the byproduct of a long time of a series of cuts and that's impacted you to the place where this domino effect. So we always uplift what the challenges are, but share with me a little bit about what kind of response are you getting um, when you talk to electeds, when you talk to uh, others out there in the community? Because um, while some I'm familiar with some of this, a lot of, a lot of uh, things that you're saying now, fresh revelation. And I'm sure for a lot of people, there's also that same thing where it's fresh revelation to them. Yeah, we do have, you know, we do have good support from some of our legislators who have been there on the front lines fighting for us and fighting with us and who will be at the rally as well. The rally... Um, is to bring awareness to those people in the community that may not really understand, um, first of all, who our community is, who are the people that we support, and also the impact that this has had on a very vulnerable population. You hear a lot about the nursing homes and you know, the, our seniors, which is, is very valid, but I think sometimes they have forgotten that people with disabilities and with developmental disabilities are a very significant um, group in the community that's vulnerable. So our legislators, what we're asking for them is to be our advocates. We're asking our governor, be our advocate and fight for that funding so that we can continue to provide those services for people who are some of our most vulnerable in our community. Yeah. Edie, for you, what's been the biggest challenge since March? I mean, we highlight March 18th to be that day when uh, for a lot of people, the, the, the world literally changed, their world literally changed. Talk to us about what's been the biggest challenge for you uh, since this is all taking place. For me, I guess the biggest challenge was um, really trying to explain to my son why he couldn't go to camp. And um, camp, he's been going to camp for the past 10 years, loves camp, made friends, um, has the same staff that he sees every summer. And for him, he had the opportunity to actually work at camp in the past two years. So not only did he go to a place that he loved and made that connection, he was also able to work and earn a paycheck, which was so um, inspiring for him. He was so happy to have the opportunity. He worked in the kitchen. He helped serve meals. The second year that he worked there, he was um, helping with food prep and he was gaining these skills to help him obtain a, a job, you know, a, a full-time regular job. Um, so for him uh, and for us in the house, seeing him again, the um, kind of the, um, his um, behavior is starting to act up again and, you know, not having, um, not doing something that he loves has really been heartbreaking for me. Um, just having him in his room and really isolated in those four walls, again, as a parent, is, um, is heartbreaking. Yeah. We pray that things get better really soon and, and quickly. Omira, how can people uh, support the great work that you guys are doing? And uh, how can we lend a helping hand? Well, I think for one, um, people should try to educate themselves about what, what it is, the work that we do. Um, I think if, um, if people are, you know, care about the most vulnerable in our community, then they will also advocate to their legislators and say, please support 
people with developmental disabilities, support the organizations that, that provide the services to them. Um, their voice is important. The families' voices are important. Families who are receiving services and who are in the community and don't have a residence that's operated, let's say, by an IAHD or a sister organization, they also have to advocate because legislators listen to their constituents and, their, and the families are their constituents. So we're asking for people to raise their voice, to, to say no more cuts, to ask for the support that we need to be able to continue to provide people with what they deserve. We're coming up to the uh, end of our segment. I'll just leave it to both of you. If there's anything that you want the public to know before we get out of here, please tell us. Uh, I, I would say that the more support that we get um, with the rally, um, the information will be shared. We'll, we'll send that out and just participate and um, speak up for our most vulnerable population. So we just, I would ask families to, to raise their voice, ask for the services that you need. Don't sit back and wait for services to be handed to you because they will not. You have to ask for what you need and you have to advocate for your loved one in order to get the services that your loved one deserves. And we're here Edie, to fight with uh, you. Yeah. Edie, Omara, thank you so much for taking the time and sharing with us. Best wishes. Uh, enjoy you. this holiday season. I know it's a lot to navigate, but we'll check back with you and find out how things are going. Thank you so much. Thank you. All righty. We are taking a quick break. We want you to stay with us here on the Social Justice Forums. We've got another very special guest doing some nutritional work. Talk about that in a minute. Do you live in the Northeast Bronx? If you live inside this blue line on the map, then you can vote in the special election to replace expelled city council member Andy King. Election day is December 22, but the polls are open as early as December 12th at certain hours. By voting, you get to choose District 12's next representative in the city council. To instantly find your polling place and voting hours, go to findmypollsite.vote.nyc. That's findmypollsite.vote.nyc. Apply for absentee ballot by December 15th by mail. Back to the show. We talk about people of color. They're severely impacted by hunger, food access, diet-related illnesses, as well as other problems with the food system. Now, the food justice movement allows communities to exercise their right to grow, sell, and eat healthy food. Green Bronx Machine is an organization building healthy, equitable, and resilient communities through inspired education, as well as local food systems and 21st century workforce development. The school-based model is using urban agriculture aligned to key school performance indicators, growing healthy students in schools to transform communities who are fragmented and marginalized into neighborhoods who are more inclusive and thriving. Joining us now to share more is the founder of the Bronx, I should say Green Bronx Machine, my friend, my brother, Stephen Ritz. And uh, Stephen, good to have you, man. Man, it is good to have you. Hello, Darren, and hello, Bronx. Yes, brother, it is good to have you, man. And I, I, I wanna first of all wish you a, a happy holiday. Good to have you sharing with us um, and the great work that you guys are doing uh, with the Green Bronx Machine. Uh, and when I, and let's just get right into it and talk a little bit about the Green Bronx Machine because when we talk about social justice, food justice is a major component of social justice. So how do you line up food justice along with social justice from your perspective? Well, let's be clear. And today I'm actually gonna do something amazing. I'm gonna take off my cheese hat because <laughs> you know what? food justice is racial justice. And let us not lose fact on the fact that the borough, our beautiful beloved borough of the Bronx, which feeds not only all of New York City, but practically the entire Eastern Seaboard, has Eastern Sea Coast, if you will, has some of the highest rates of food insecurity and diet related diseases in all of New York State, if not the nation. 
So food justice is racial justice. And in a borough that is increasingly black and brown, we have got to start getting healthy, fresh food to people. And that's what this movement is all about. It is about yeah, well, something greater. And when we talk about it, listen, I mean, honestly, we look and we see how many people are struggling just to have the basic necessities of food insecurity, uh, through food insecurity. Food insecurity is huge. COVID-19 has actually impacted people in a more prevalent way. Talk to us about the work that you're doing right now, even in COVID-19, because things have actually ramped up a whole lot. Well, COVID-19 has the there's no way to say there was a blessing around COVID-19. So let me be clear about that. But what COVID-19 has done, what this virus has done, is called into, into play the virus, uh, the, the symptomatic virus of three larger viruses, greed, corruption, and racism. It mm. didn't take a virus to kill a quarter of a million people, largely black, black and brown, predominantly poor. Um, and I don't want to discount anybody's life. But let's really talk about where this pandemic is hitting New York City, right here in the Bronx, in parts of Brooklyn, in parts of Queens, in parts of Staten Island, where predominantly the residents are black and brown and immigrant, where predominantly there is limited access to healthy, fresh food. And while we certainly provide the greatest number of essential workers and frontline workers, we will be the last to see the vaccine in communities like ours. So what's the most important thing we can do? Well, the best way to boost your immune system is to consume healthy, fresh fruits and vegetables. And this has been first and foremost on all the work that we have been doing here at Green Bronze Machine since, you know, since school shuttered back in March and then again recently. And since then, we have found new ways to source food, to secure food, to get people food in ways that we've never imagined. We've leveraged every single asset of our community to put unity in our community. We've leveled foundational elders at NYCHA to be runners and messengers and harbingers of good food. We've planted over 100,000 seedlings um, you know, this summer alone. Between my wife and I, along with some amazing partners, we have personally delivered over 100,000 pounds of food across the borough. Look, I'm up here in school growing food now. We wow. just harvested out last weekend. Uh, we brought it to, believe it or not, not far from where you're broadcasting from right now, um, not far from the Lehman campus. Part of the solution this weekend, we helped them get food out. The week before we were at City Harvest and uh, Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams, who's a staunch advocate and perhaps for food justice and perhaps New York City's most famous vegan, um, bringing 35,000 pounds of food to, you know, to Melrose houses. So we are out here, we're working, we are working harder, we're working smarter. We figured out ways to get food into communities for children um, week by week. So we drop off food at certain designated locations on Tuesdays and then Zoom cook on Wednesdays and children have the access to these ingredients. It's not about some washed up celebrity chef looking for imprints, you know, talking about, oh, you can cook Chateaubriand while our kids are home, you know, eating Pop-Tart, Pop-Tarts or chips and oftentimes, sadly, nothing. It's really about creating meaningful opportunities so that this horrible moment and it has been a horrible moment in American history, can give birth to a movement where we remember the pain, the names, and the anguish of each and every person lost in this pandemic. Because now more than ever, it's about education, not asphyxiation. Yeah, I wanna talk a little bit more about the work that you're doing in the classroom, Green Bronx Machine, taking it to the classroom, helping students understand their healthy living, helping to really put uh, you know, their foot down in the area of bringing food justice. Talk to us about what you're doing right now and how you know, students are actually playing a huge part in this area. Listen, the students are, I'm here, but they're really running the show because I'm responsive to their needs. You know, the greatest compliment I got this summer was when a child uh, in front of another child asked me to buy him a soda. And the child, the one child turned around and said, asking Mr. Ritz to buy you a soda is like asking your mama for a cigarette. That's mm. the kind of accountability that we want amongst our children. We want our children to understand that they are growing something greater. One of the things that we're really inspired about is we are using solar powered internet providers in our garden. So you don't have to go to Starbucks. You can go to the garden 
and actually get access to the internet and healthy fresh food and odds are some good kind mentoring with your elders as well. So for us, it's always about how does one and one not make two, but how does one and one make 11? We understand that we're not gonna be invited to the table, so we're gonna build our own. And that's exactly what we're doing. Believe it or not, I mean, Darren, how do I know? And I would have brought pictures of a gentleman named Brother Mike, who's right here in a wheelchair in Claremont Village, delivering food with us weekly via his wheelchair to his uh -huh. cohort of people. And that's what this movement has really brought about, incredible heroes. And let us always remember their names and always remember our collective pain and let this moment not be lost on a movement, I, on a for a movement, because I do not want to get back to normal. I want all of us to get back to better. Right. It's not about normal. It is about better. You use the word movement. I want to talk about that for a minute because, uh, you know, people know you now and they've seen you. And I can say, listen, I've had the luxury of doing you for years when this thing first got started and birthed inside of you to where it is today. Talk to us about that journey, about where you started and where you are today and how people might be able to see a little bit more about that journey, too. Well, you know, listen, that journey started right up the block from BronxNet, literally on the Walton campus. And I am forever grateful for that accidental moment. But, you know, it, it goes to show you that, you know, you can't rush growth. You can't go from seed to harvest without cultivation in the middle. And that's what this movement mm. is really about. Cultivating people, cultivating opportunities. To think that this very classroom in the middle of Claremont Village in a 110 year old building, still under scaffolding, I might add, has been visited by 60 nations and people from six continents um, to look at our model speaks to something that simply screams from the Bronx to the world that with community all is possible. But it has been a remarkable journey. You know, I highlighted it a few years ago in my book called The Power of a Plant, which went on to become a national bestseller. It's used in school systems all across the world, which makes me proud, including ones where I've been asked to work elsewhere from, I might yeah. add. And you know, now I'm super proud that we in 2021 will be debuting a documentary called Generation Growth. You can visit that on the Green Bronx Machine website. Um, it's a documentary that was two years in the making, highlighting our expansion across the country into some of the most marginalized communities in the world. And this is something now more than ever we need. We need to put the unity back into our community. We need to scream that teachers matter and let compassion be the new curriculum. Uh, you know, 2,200 jobs later, here we are. I'm hearing from children this morning who are working on the front line, contributing to food and health and a thriving ecosystem despite the challenges here in New York City. So it's, it's amazing what can happen. And it yeah. all starts with a seed. You know, children are seeds, ideas are seeds. And the Bronx is one of the most fertile grounds for, you know, absolute disruption possible. And we are proof positive of that. We are not going to let people get fat on the dysfunction of this borough of prior mistakes um, we want to empower local residents to be the beneficiaries of years and years and decades of neglect and poor policy to grow something greater. I'm thrilled our children are boycotting fast food. I'm thrilled that they're staying out of that fast food joint up the block that didn't that chain that did not want to pay farm workers who look like their parents one penny more a pound. And every time I keep a burger out of a kid's belly and replace it with a banana, not only am I helping them in their immunity, I'm helping the planet as well, which is awesome sauce. Yeah. Well, I want to get here for a moment because when we talk about that, you're encouraging students to do healthy living. There have been critics who say, first of all, uh, you know, that's a parent's job. But secondly, there are critics who also say, students, they're not going to be really too receptive to that. They're not really going to be able to tap in and buy in. But when it, I think about your work, I think about the things that you've done, I look at the fact of how you are able not just to get student buy-in, you've got parental buy-in, you've got community buy-in. What has been the key in having such a transformative you know, process uh, in the hearts and minds of those people? Because that's not an easy lift, but it seems as though you, 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 you've done it. Well, who could resist the guy with the cheese hat? Um, <laughs> you know, it goes to one simple thing. Children get it. 
you know, the next generation of Greta Thunbergs and, and the next Malala often sits right here in public housing. The next Barack Obama, the next Darren Heine, you know, the next Sondra Sotomayor is right here in my classroom. These children get it. They understand that they are the canaries in the coal mine. So just like McDonald's figured it out years ago, how do you scale? You scale through children. It's the mommy, mommy, mommy factor. Listen, my parents didn't stop smoking because the Surgeon General told them it was going to kill them. My parents stopped smoking because my brother and I, ages, I think, you know, nine and four or five at the time, made them crazy. So the mommy, mommy factor works. Listen, McDonald's scales by happy meals, not by happy and healthy people. So by the same token, if you can empower children to have these nurturing relationships with the world, with the planet, and cultivate a palate at a young taste, that, at a young age that puts them on a trajectory of healthy success and healthy living and academic success, my God, we've changed everything. I think, you know, part of the reason why I was able to scale, getting back to your question, is I was dealing with people too late. You know, I remember when you and I had all those older kids, high school kids, and what gave me credibility was jobs. And often, many of them had children themselves. But the key is this, Darren, rich people, poor people. I've never met a person who comes out and says, yeah, I really don't want what's best for my child. I believe every parent wants what's best for their child. And it's up to us to educate them. We need to stop celebritizing food, the official soft drink, the official pizza, the official candy bar. You know, I'm the first to get out there and say, shame on Shaq for pushing all that crap out there. You know, when Beyonce starts giving Diet Pepsi to her kids, I'll start giving it to mine. But in the meantime, don't make money off the backs of people who have built you, off communities who adore you. We need to come together and grow our own local businesses and our own local people and realize that, you know, Eric Adams says it best, you know, for a long time, zip code and skin color determined outcomes in life. But it's, it's no longer birthright, it's breakfast. It's no longer lineage, it's lunch. And it's no longer our DNA, it's dinner that's affecting ourselves. It's mm -hmm. dinner that's really, it, it's what we're eating that is determining health outcomes and financial empowerment often for others around that. Amazing work. I mean, listen, I, I, I sit and I listen all the time and I'm also like amazed just by, not that I, not that the words that you say, but by the fruit that's literally on the tree. How about that one? Uh, and the fruit that you're actually able to bring uh, to a community. And when we talk about the Bronx, we know that the Bronx is still number 62 out of all the counties when it comes to health, but yet and still a lot of improvements. Talk to us about what you see happening for the work that you're doing with Green Bronx Machine uh, and the other things that are happening as we move into 2021 that's going to improve uh, the quality of the neighborhood and then also the quality of what goes on in the borough. Sure, so big shout out to the Bronx overall. The Bronx in my lifetime has never ever looked better. And I think we only need to remember that I started my teaching in 1984 at South Bronx High School when it was the only standing building for eight square blocks. So the Bronx has come a long, long way. But along that way, we've also kind of developed very quickly. And some of it is overdevelopment. Some of it is we've lost, as I would say, some of our roots. You know, the notion to kind of want these things that we, these shiny objects that we think are so important. We have devalued public education tremendously. And let us be clear, you know, the greatest lever this nation and this city has for creating equity, removing the systemic barriers to injustice is public education. And that's, you know, why I am so rooted and committed in this work at the youngest age possible, because education is the great equalizer. Now we've got to make it equal. Uh, what I'm excited about is there has never been greater awareness about the discrepancies between the rich and the poor. Um, sadly, it took the death of so many African Americans this year. I, hello, the, the, the bells were going off for years. The alarm clock was going off for years. Did we really need George Floyd to be asphyxiated the way he was for us to say something's not right in our communities? I think not. But again, let us remember his name. Let us remember the pain and let us come together to really grow something better to really reimagine the way we look at children, the way we look at, at problems. Listen, when plant, I'm gonna give you a simple plant analogy. 
When I grow plants, if the plants don't work, I don't blame, don't grow. I don't blame the seed. We look at the environment. Did I give them enough water? Was the soil healthy? Did they have access to light? We need to start looking at marginalized communities the same way. We can't keep blaming people for being poor. I will tell you that here in the South Bronx, being poor is a tough job. It has never been harder than ever. And the pandemic has really called attention to that around access to the internet, around access to devices, around access to healthy, fresh food. Now, my goal, and thanks to you, your job is to make sure that we cultivate an appetite for equity. It's no longer enough to say, oh, I'm not a racist. And I believe I meet a lot of people each and every day who say they, are, who say they aren't racist and probably believe they're not. But what are we doing in terms of policy that demonstrates that we are actively anti-racist in all that we do? You know, I jokingly say, I'm getting tired of philanthropy and there's been some amazing philanthropy this year. So for those who are donating and contributing and the movements that we see across the borough and across the city and the nation, God bless you. I feel you, I see you, and I appreciate you. But here's the deal. Philanthropy will send a whole bunch of bottles of water to Michigan and we'll judge the efficacy of that philanthropy on how many bottles of water we send. But what we really need is good policy and good policy will make right. sure that those residents have water for life and people who violate that will be dealt with accordingly as in prison because that's what we need to do. We need to stop selling the rights of our children and the future of marginalized communities down the drain for you know quarterly profits. We need to really get to compassion. We need to let empathy be our North Star. And I'm really excited that, you know, the election is over and uh, one virus is coming to an end, as is another. And hopefully we can look to better, brighter days for all of us and the planet. That's what this is about. Stephen Ritz, we got to leave it there, brother. But thank you so much for the great work that you continue to do, educating our viewers. Um, and we, we must say that, you know, uh, I, I think that you started with the seed. Uh, and as you started with the seed, it's grown into a plentiful harvest. Thanks a lot, uh, Stephen Ritz, for being with us in the green. Remember this, the most important school supply in the world is food, especially if you don't have it. So fuel your body, fuel your mind. Darren, God bless you. Can't wait to see you. Always a salad waiting for you up here in the classroom, my man. So come Bruh. visit, you heard? Bruh, I'll be there as soon as I can get there. <laughs> A public education. I'm joking with the kids. I was teaching how to tell time. I feel like the flavor of flavor of public education these days. <laughs> Get out there and make epic happen. Much love. Much love, brother. I'll talk to you later. Steven Ritz, our guest from the Green Bronx Machine. Uh, is it, I, I, and I'll take a moment of personal privilege. I mean, I've known Steven for a long, long time. And uh, to see where he is today and how many people he's helped uh, and his passion and how it's actually changed down to, not changed, down through the years, but it's actually grown, just like the work that he's done. I've shrunk, I've shrunk, but it's grown. Yes, yes, sir. We we love him, Stephen Ritz. All right, well, that about wraps up here for the Social Justice Forums. We are out of show. Thank you to all of our guests for sharing with us today. Now, be sure to tune, tune in next week. We'll get you a brand new episode. Where we'll be talking about social justice in another magnitude. Uh, continue to share the conversation. Continue to share uh, information and resources as we continue to bring you. Uh, yet more and more from the social justice forums. Darren Jaime saying, take care, everybody. God bless. We'll see you soon.